battle against these guys. And what we saw is that when he began to attack this army, um, at that point, that's when God granted him insight and wisdom that he didn't have prior to that. Um, it was at that point that God caused the improbable to happen. And it was later on that him and his actions and the actions of his 300 men inspired all sorts of other people to join in the battle as well. Um, it is a great story. Um, Gideon is one of the greatest stories I, of the Bible. I love it. It's very interesting. But I want you to know that's not the end of the story. What we're going to see today is this, is that Satan will shift tactics once we take action. So last week I left you with, you know what God wants you to do. Now you need to start putting it into practice and doing what God wants you to do. But when you do that, God or Satan will shift tactics. You see, at first Satan's tactic is this. Before you take action for the kingdom of God, his entire attempt is this, is to keep you from taking that action. They kind of keep putting it off and putting it off and going, I'll do it next week. And there might be some of you sitting here right now that you still know what God, you still know what God wants you to do. And I told you to start it last week, and you're going, well, this is the week I'm going to start. And, and see, Satan's first tactic is always, before you act, I'll try to prevent you from ever getting to that point of action. Once you start to act, he actually changes his strategy. And here's what I've seen in life is, once you start to act, what he does is he tries to prevent you from accomplishing what God has called you to do. And what he will do is he will throw obstacles in your way. He'll put things in your path uh, that will discourage you and try to get you to a point where you will never see success to the actions you took, and you will just throw your hands up, and you'll go, you know what, I'm just done with it, I'm just tired, I don't want to do this anymore, and we'll just blend back in the living life like everybody else. Because Satan knows this, he knows that when we begin to take action all too often, we go into it as human beings with unrealistic expectations. We actually think when we take action for the kingdom of God that things are going to go smoothly and it's going to be perfect, like things are just going to be like... It just works perfect because God's hands on this thing. And what we find out is this. That's not typically how it works. Usually there's struggle. Usually there's a lot of issues. And Heather, go ahead and try to mute the stupid thing again. It drives me crazy. It drives all of us crazy. It's a sense we, side note, let's step out of the sermon for a minute. We have a sensor over here that we don't know what it's attached to that beeps randomly throughout the week. And it's beeping again this Sunday. So there you go. Um, I don't know where Heather's going now. Oh, all right. Well, let's go back to things. So here's the thing. We have an unrealistic expectation of perfection. We go, we're going to act in the name of Christ. We're going to do what God has called us to do. And all of a sudden, things are going to get wonderful. And we find out that's not how it works. Um, Abraham Lincoln, and we talked about some last week, um, going into the Civil War, when the Civil War began, he actually thought it was going to last about six months at the longest. Um, he actually thought once he put the army out there that the Confederates would just kind of walk back. They'd have a couple of battles, and then they would walk it back and be like, no, we're sorry, and they would just rejoin back into the Union, and everything would be fine. Um, unfortunately, we know from history, it lasted four and a half bloody years. And Abraham Lincoln faced many obstacles uh, that he had to push through before he saw success in this battle that he had started. Uh, for instance, here's some of the obstacles he had. One of the obstacles he had was that he had to replace several of his key generals. Um, one of his key generals wouldn't follow his orders, and there were several others, but one of them, George McClellan. How many of you have heard George McClellan? If you're a Civil War buff, you know this guy. George McClellan was his top general early on in the Civil War, and basically he would refuse to follow the orders of Abraham Lincoln at times. And we see Abraham Lincoln, and we go, it's Abraham Lincoln. If he said do this, you just do this because it's a great Abraham Lincoln. Uh, George McClellan, they had such a relationship. Um, there's a story. Abraham Lincoln went to visit him at his headquarters on the battlefield, like in his house. And he got there, and George McClellan was out somewhere else on the battlefield. Abraham Lincoln shows up and has a seat um, down in like, the living room. McClellan comes back to the house and goes directly upstairs, never addresses him. Goes upstairs, spends five hours upstairs. Eventually, after five hours of leaving Abraham Lincoln sitting down in the main room, sends one of his guys down to tell him that he'd already gone to bed. And if he wanted to hang out till the next day, he could talk to him then. Okay? That's one of his generals, and this is the great Abraham Lincoln. That's the type of stuff he was facing um, in the Civil War as he led this action against the South. Uh, another thing he had is members of Congress, they were called the Peace Democrats, um, were actively working against the war time and time again. They were trying to undermine him through Congress and stuff and put different things that would prevent him from carrying on the war, and he was constantly battling them. 
Um, he had to arrest 20,000 civilians from the north uh, who were classified as actively working against the war effort and for disloyal acts against the United States government. And so he had over 20,000 people over time arrested um, and put in jail or interrogated to basically figure out what are you up to and are you trying to undermine our war effort. Um, on the top of all of that, he watched 620,000 Americans lose their lives, not just be wounded and be casualties of war, but actually die in battle, 620,000. And if you've read the stories about him and some of his own writings, that stuff tore him to pieces. Um, he seems to have been a very depressed guy um, and just struggled through all this because it was a very difficult period. It was very difficult to see success. Yet, with all these obstacles, uh, that could have caused Lincoln to just go, I'm done with this thing. I'm resigning. I'm walking away. We're done with this battle. Uh, he never did. He always pushed forward until he had attained success. This morning, we're going to see Gideon, and he's going to achieve success this morning, but not without having to face several obstacles of his own. And we're going to learn from his obstacles, because I think the obstacles he faces are the same ones we will when we start serving the kingdom of God and we start putting into actions the things we know God has called us to do. The same uh, obstacles that you see Gideon face are the same ones we're going to face. Again, I will say this, forgive me for my pronunciation of some of these names. I do the best I can, but this entire story of Gideon has so many weird names. So I've said before, Jason over there, who can say these all perfectly, don't judge me. Okay, here we go. Here's what it says, chapter 8. We kick back into the story. It says this, it says, Then the people of Ephraim um, asked Gideon, Why have you treated us this way? Why didn't you send for us when we first went out uh, to fight the Midianites? And they argued heatedly with Gideon. Now, real quick, you're going, who are they? The end of last week, Gideon leads us 300 men against 135,000. They all get into confusion. They fight each other. The, the army fights itself. They all start to flee. And if you remember, Gideon sends out messengers to all the different places to tell the guys, join the battle and cut these guys down. One of the groups he calls to is Ephraim, the people of Ephraim. And he says, you guys, would you go after these guys? And they went after two leaders. And what happens is they catch those leaders, they kill them, and they bring the heads back. That's how it ended last week, the heads back to Gideon to confirm we've killed these guys. Gideon then in conversation, he has it with them, and they're ticked off at Gideon. They've just had incredible victory. Gideon has just led, led them to freedom after being occupied for years. And their first thing that Gideon is to complain to him. Why didn't you ask us when you first collected the army, why didn't you come get us? Why didn't you come get us then? And yeah, we did this for you, but why didn't you get us at the beginning? And they start having an argument with him. And here's Gideon's reply. It says, Gideon replied, what have I accomplished compared to you? Aren't even the leftover grapes, grapes of Ephraim harvest better than the entire crop of my little clan of Abazir. God gave you victory over Oreb and Zeb, the commanders of the Midianite army. What have I accomplished compared to that? When the men of Ephraim heard Gideon's answer, their anger subsided. So what does Gideon do? He like kisses up to him, right? Okay. They start complaining to him, why don't you do this? He's in the heat of battle. He's tired. And they start whining to him, and what he does is he basically kisses up to him, and they finally go, okay, we're not going to complain to you anymore. And here's what I want you to understand. One of the obstacles you will face when you start pursuing success for the kingdom of God is that you will run into people who will do nothing but complain about you. They will complain about you behind your back. They will complain to you to your face. They will complain out in public about you, and Satan will use them to try to get you to just go, I'm just going to throw my hands up and I'm not in for this. I was in for taking action for the kingdom of God. I know this is what God wants me to do, but I'm tired of these people talking about me. So I'm just done with it. And I'm just going to walk away from it. How many of you have experienced this before? Whenever you are having any type of success in your life, there's always complainers. Been there? Okay. It's the people who just constantly snipe at you. No matter how good you do, no matter how perfect your actions are, no matter what, they will find a reason to criticize you. And that's what Gideon finds is you have a guy, he took 300 men and he just tore up an army of 135,000, sent them into chaos. And these people's first thoughts are, let's complain to him about how you messed this up and you should have asked us first. Okay, you will always have that. That's always gonna be an obstacle that Satan uses to try to get you to quit and just go, I'm done with this thing. And here's what you need to know. You have to push through it. You must push on. You, you must continue on in your actions that God has called you to achieve in your life. In Judges 8, uh, starting in verse 4, it carries on. 
It says, Gideon then crossed the Jordan River with his 300 men. And though exhausted, they continued to chase the enemy. When they reached Sakoth, uh, Gideon asked the leaders of the town, please give my warriors some food. They're very tired, and I am chasing Zabah and Zalmunah, uh, the kings of Midian. Uh, but the officials of Sakoth replied, catch Zabah and Zalmunah first, then we will feed your army. So Gideon comes to this town. And he basically says, can you give us some food tomorrow? We're dying. We've been fighting for hours. We just need something so we can continue on. And they basically say, go get them first, then come back to us, and we'll give you some food. He says, so Gideon said, after the Lord gives me victory over Zabah and Zalmanah, I will return and tear your flesh with thorns and briars from the wilderness. From there, Gideon went up to Penel and again asked for food, but he got the same answer. So another time they say the same thing. So he said to the people of Penel, after I return in victory, I will tear down this tower. So there must have been a tower in their town. And here we see the second obstacle. When you pursue success for the kingdom of God, the next thing you will find is there will be people you expected to support you that won't, that will leave you hanging to dry, and they won't get on board with you, and they will just go, no, you know what, I don't want any part of this. And the purpose of that in Satan's scheme of things is it gets you to go, I'm on my own. The people I thought that were going to support me won't support me, and I, I'm just done. I'm fatigued. I'm tired. I've been fighting this fight, and these people won't support me, and no one has my back, and so I'm just going to wipe my hands and be done. And, and if you give up, Satan has accomplished his goal. That's what he wants you to do. When you take action, he wants you to just quit. He wants you to throw your hands up and just be done with it. A personal example of this. I had this one happen. It was one of the worst things in my life. Um, in a previous ministry I was there, and we had some thing happen in the church. We had this little conflict thing. I was much younger at this time in my life. So now I'm an old man. Back then, I was just a young kid. I was a young pup back then. Um, so uh, at this time, we were there, and we had some conflict. And I remember it was going to be some pretty rough conflict. And one of the guys I really respected, and he was about 10 years older than me, and he was, he was pretty high up in this church that we were in, um, expected him because he had been pushing and pushing for me to do what I was having to do. And I remember one day when I was getting down to, okay, we're going to have to do this tough decision. And I went into his office one day, and I remember going, okay, are you on board um, with us doing this? And I remember him looking at me going, yeah, I don't think so. And I remember going, what are you talking about? You don't think so. You, you've been pushing this the whole time. You've been with us. And yeah, I think I'm done at this point. And I remember going, what is going on? And I remember I went home that day, and he sent me an email. And here's how the email was written. Uh, it said this in so many words. Scott, I believe God's put you here for this reason. I believe God's given you the personality to do this stuff, and I know God is using you throughout this whole entire situation that we're going through. And I'm so glad God has you here. But I just want you to know, publicly, I will never support you because my personality is different than yours. And what I will do is I'll just wait to see who comes out in the victory and then I'll help raise them up and support them because that's my personality is I just support people. And I remember sitting there going, oh my gosh, did I really just read what I just read? Um, and I remember sitting there for probably a good hour to two hours with God and prayer just feeling totally defeated and just going, I'm, what's the point of fighting this anymore? I just, I'm done with this thing. Uh, and I remember getting to that point. It took God about two, two and a half hours to just go, it doesn't matter, Scott, you have to do what I'm calling you to do and you've got to go forward. Um, even without Joe, that we will call him, uh, you have to go forward even if he's not supporting you because you have to do what God, what I've called you to do. And I remember I had to go ahead and I had to do that. And he absolutely stood on the sidelines, um, watched everything go down, and then he just kind of rose after it all was all over and started supporting us and the other staff uh, that were there. And then he kind of jumped back on board and you were like, this is really weird. Okay. How many of you have had that happen to you before? Someone that you expected to support you and they just, they just bailed on you. Been there? Okay, when you are taking action for the kingdom of God, Satan will use these opportunities to defeat you. He will use these opportunities to leave you feeling like you are hanging out the dry and so that you forget that God is still with you and you'll look and go, but no one else is. And you'll go, maybe I just need to quit. And that's what happens to Gideon. Gideon shows up to his two towns going, I expect you guys to give us some food and water. And they go, go get victory first. Then come back, and we will give you the stuff. And what their assumption is, looking at this, probably what they were thinking, if you go after them and you lose, they're going to come back and cut all of our heads off. 
So we're going to wait to make sure you can actually defeat them first. Once you defeat them, then you can come back and now we'll support you. Uh, that's kind of what their philosophy was. And you will see that as an obstacle. And here's the thing, when it happens in your life, when you are acting the way God wants you to act and people don't support you the way you thought they should, you have to push on. Uh, you have to continue to achieve what God has called you to do for the kingdom of God. It goes on to the next place. Uh, verse 10, it says, By this time, Zabah and Zaluma uh, were in Karkor with about 15,000 warriors. All that remained of the allied army of the east, for 120 had already been killed. Gideon circled around by the caravan route uh, east of Naba and Jogbaha, uh, taking the Midianite army by surprise. Zabah and Zalaman, uh, the two Midianite kings, fled, but Gideon chased them down and captured all their warriors. After this, Gideon returned, uh, returned from the battle by the way of Hurez Pass. There he captured a young man from Sakoth and demanded that he write down the names of all 77 officials and elders of the town. Gideon then returned to Sakoth and said to the leaders, Here's Zaba and Zalmana. Uh, when, you were, when we were here before, you taunted me, saying, Catch Zaba and Zalmana first, and then we will feed your exhausted army. Then Gideon took the elders of the town and he taught them a lesson, punishing them with thorns and briars from the wilderness. So basically, it looks like he probably took them and whipped them uh, with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He also tore down the tower of Peniel and killed all the men in the town. So he goes to the first town, he whips the elders, he gets the names from one of the guys, says, tell me who all the elders of the town is, goes back and probably calls them out of their houses and goes, get out here, and their guys beat them publicly. Goes to the second town, tears down their tower, and then he kills all the men of the town. Now, let me tell you the obstacle you face here. As I look at that, and most of us probably look at that and go, that was probably a little extreme, right? Like, Joe, I didn't go into his office the next day and be like, hey, Joe, come over here. And then I, like, decked him, and I started kicking him on the ground and be like, take that, all right? That's kind of what Gideon did. Gideon goes back and goes, you guys didn't have my back. You didn't support me, and now I'm going to punish you. To the extreme that he goes and kills this other group of guys. And what I look at that is I don't think that was probably God's intended desire for Gideon to do. What you have to understand is these biblical characters, they're not perfect people. They don't do everything right. Just because it's in Scripture doesn't mean what they did was good. The interesting thing of Scripture is this. Most of the heroes we see in the Scriptures are people that had major faults. Have you ever noticed that? Like, they don't make all the right decisions. They make some horrific decisions. They do things that aren't right. Um, and you're going, why would the Bible put that stuff in there? Usually you usually try to exalt people. And go, well, it puts it in there to let you know they're like us. They have failures. They make bad decisions. And I look at this and I go, my perspective is Gideon made a bad decision here. Um, Gideon went in and slaughtered a whole town of men just because they didn't support him. The other guys he publicly beats um, in front of the town because they wouldn't support him. And the obstacle I see of this, sometimes the obstacles we face that Satan will use against us is our own poor decisions. We make bad decisions. And we do things we know we shouldn't have done. And what happens a lot of times when I becomes an obstacle is this. We go, because I didn't do it perfectly, because I messed this up, I'm unworthy to continue to serve God. And what we do is a lot of times we'll just put our hands up and go, I'll just blend back in. I'm not going to serve anymore. I'm not going to lead anymore. I'm not going to do that because I'm not perfect and I really messed this up and I made a bad decision and I can't accept that God can still use me and we give up. But when that happens, we have to push on. Um, God doesn't call you to perfection. God knows that you will never do everything right. You will mess things up. You will do things that you look back on and regret and go, man, I was trying to serve God and I just totally blew that situation up and that was horrible how I handled that and I didn't represent Jesus real well there. And that just wasn't a good representation of the entire kingdom of God. And instead of going, I, I won't serve anymore, you have to push on. You have to go, yeah, you made a mistake. You know what? God still has called you to complete this task. God has still called you to that. Even if you made a bonehead decision, God has still called you to something greater, right? Judges 18 and 19, it says, Then Gideon asked Zabah and Zalmana, uh, the men you killed at Tabar, uh, what were they like? Like you, they replied. They all had the look of a king's son. 
They were my brothers, the sons of my own mother, Gideon explained. As surely as the Lord lives, I wouldn't kill you if you hadn't killed them. So what Gideon finds out here is this group, as they were escaping or when they were coming in, actually went through a town where a bunch of his brothers were, and they slaughtered his brothers. And Gideon finds this out now. And it goes on, he says, turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword, for he was only a young boy and was afraid. Then Zabah and Zalmanah said to Gideon, be a man, kill us yourself. I love that. See, they speak just like me. So they said to Gideon, be a man, kill us yourselves. So Gideon killed them both, and he took the royal ornaments from the necks of their camels. All right? And here we see the last major obstacle that can happen when we begin to take action and serve the kingdom of God is what we will see is this. At times, you will suffer loss in an, attack, or in an attempt to distract you. Um, you will have catastrophic things happen in your life in an effort for you to go, you know what? I got to take my focus off God and what he's called me to do. And I've got to focus over here because this is so bad. And there's so much pain here. I need to just need to be focused on this. And this is where I need to be. And God can wait and God can just be over there. And that's what we see with Gideon. Gideon comes after this huge battle, all the success. And he finds out towards the end of the battle being over, he finds out after he's captured the last two kings, they've slaughtered all of his brothers in a nearby town. And Gideon's sitting there going, how, how in the world? And he goes, I wouldn't have killed you, but now I'm going to because you slaughtered all my brothers. So he asks his son, who must have been a little kid, cut their heads off. And the son's like, I can't, Dad. And it says, they say to Gideon, be a man, do it yourself. Um, and he takes a sword and he kills them. And what you see is our last obstacle is, again, that, that major loss that can happen in our lives. Sometimes that someone dear to us dies. Sometimes that someone dear to us gets a disease or a cancer or something like that. And what we do is we shift all of our focus to that situation. And we never, ever get back to doing what God had called us to do. And we want to do what God wanted us to do. Because we suffer loss and we go, that's all I can think about anymore. When those times happen, what you have to do is you have to continue on. You have to push on. And you have to go, just because I suffer loss does not mean that I don't have to do what God's called me you still have to push on. You still have to accomplish what it is God has called you to do. You see, when you take action, rarely do things ever happen to perfection. Rarely do things always go the way you wish they would go. That, that is very rare to happen. Uh, but you can't let imperfection stop you from completing the task God has called you to. You can't just throw your hands up and go, I'm done with it. Satan will try to place obstacles in your way in order to get you to give up in order for you to fall short of what God has called you to do. And what he will do is he will use people to complain about you in order to get you to quit. He will convince people to not support you, try to get you to quit. He will get you to look at your mistakes so that you start to condemn yourself in order for you to quit and to give up. And he will cause pain in your life to distract you in order to get you to quit and never achieve what God has called you to do. But I want you to understand this morning, success isn't about everything going the way you plan. Um, it's about seeing through to completion a task that God has given you. Let me read that one more time because you need to understand this. Success is not about everything going the way you planned before you started your action. What success is for the kingdom of God is seeing through to completion a task that God has given you. Don't ever give up. Don't ever throw your hands up and go, I'm too tired. Push on because God has called you to do great things for the kingdom of God that will affect the eternity of people's lives. So never fall in when the obstacles are presented to you and just go, it's too big of an obstacle. God will always be there. God will always be at your side and God will always provide what you need to continue to push on and continue to achieve the thing that he has called you to do for the kingdom of God. Never give up. Even if perfection isn't there, don't ever give up. Would you pray with me?